Welcome back, America. Richard Norton Smith is my guest, old friend, longtime friend, an ordinary man. He helped me when I opened the Nixon Library. Uh, very complicated series of anecdotes about RN in here, Richard. Are you going to do the RN biography next? I mean, you really should oh, do like a four-volume set on Richard Nixon. <laughs> exactly. Well, guess what? I'm almost 70, as you know, <laughs> and uh, this is the last big – this biography took 10 years. And, well, uh, but you're right. I mean, the, the, the definitive Nixon, you know, like I think, in my opinion, the definitive LBJ is yet to be, yet to be written. But it won't be by me. But you're right. The, the Nixon Ford relationship is fascinating. Oh my goodness! Involves. Yes, they were clearly closer than I think we suspected early in their careers. Um, but I also think the pardon was a. I, you know, I don't think the relationship really ever recovered in some ways. I well, mean, yeah, I didn't know the story years. about RN being in his office, and I spent a lot of time in that office in San Clemente. I spent a lot of time at the San Clemente Inn, which makes a cameo in this book. And oh, yeah. I didn't know that he looked so bad when, yeah. uh, was it Hartman who went out to see him? I can't remember that detail. It's not my outline. Someone was sent by Jerry Ford to talk to him about this, and, and RN looked like he was, you know, not going to make oh, it yeah. to the it campaign. Was the lawyer, it was, um, um, oh, gosh, your name escapes me. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. No, no, he would never have sent Hartman. He would be too, too Hartman was a real uh, a contentious figure. Um, the, the White House was divided, basically, into people who thought Hartman was a useful counterbalance to the president's inclination to see the good in everyone because Hartman saw the opposite. And, and, you know, you need to have something like that um, yeah, in, in a White House. So, I loved the uh, fact that you've got Stu Spencer in here. Now, I knew Stu a little bit from the oh, wheel wagoner or whatever, the wheel spinners Christmas party. Yeah. And I, I'm glad someone else says Holy Toledo besides me, but that's what he said after the infamous <laughs> debate with um, Jimmy Carter <laughs> They're just, I didn't know any of that. I didn't know that Ford, I had yeah. forgotten that he hung on for three well, days. I mean, there's a book that needs to be written, you know, and, and I don't think Stu will ever do it. Uh, but, I mean, Stu is, the, is a uniquely knowledgeable figure in the history of American politics. And, and he's got the best stories. And they're all true. And he, you know, but, I, and a lot of them show up in this book. And, and it's part of the, you know, there is a surprising quality, a lot of surprising qualities to Ford, um, the man himself and, and, and his presidency. We think of Ford as kind of a caretaker who sort of cleaned up the messes that he inherited, whether it was Watergate or Vietnam. Or remember the CIA, the so-called rogue elephant? Yep. The, the biggest surprise in this book is how much Ford initiated. Try to explain to someone today, a young person, that there was a time not so long ago, when bureaucrats in Washington dictated where planes could fly, what trucks could carry, where you could get a home mortgage. You know, Ford started economic deregulation. He deregulated the rail, line, rail lines and the financial services agency. And then the Carter and the Reagan administrations picked up deregulation in a bipartisan way. Today, we take it for granted. It is a transforming obviously, uh, in its impact on the American economy. Boy, the um, difference one. between then and now. Uh, Operation Paul Bunyan, during the campaign, North Korea comes over, kills two American soldiers, and Gerald Ford can choose to respond. And he sends the Midway, a carrier, and a bunch of F-111s. I mean, he just throws, it's like Maya well, goes 2.0. It, it, it really was the biggest response on the Korean Peninsula since the armistice. And the, here's the amazing thing. It happens during the Republican convention, right? You know, on the very night, you know, that he and the Reagan forces are, are battling, uh, and what does it produce? Something that's never happened since. It produced an apology from um, Kim Il Sung. Um, you know, for whatever it's worth. But I mean, uh, it. You know, talk about pushing someone back into their box. Yeah. Uh, and yet it was. A, it was a. You know, Kissinger wanted more typically. Uh, and Ford thought, well, we could do more later if we need to, but let's have a measured response, but a, but a, a major response. And it basically uh, got what it, but again, it's totally forgotten. Nobody yeah. remembers it. Nobody well, remembers that's... the Mayaguez. I mean, you know, there's, there's just, there's some, it's almost like there's this black hole, you know, in 1975 and 1976. 
And nobody yeah, remembers funny. Richard Schweiker. I had forgotten Richard Schweiker, the Hail Mary from Ronald Reagan. No. <laughs> and that's why when people say, let Reagan be Reagan, I'll say, well, which Reagan are we talking about? Are we talking about the Reagan who was willing to put Dick Schweiker, the most liberal Republican in the Senate, on, on his ticket? The funny thing, of course, Reagan was hard of hearing. And, and he thought that the, the people around him who were selling him on this were trying to get him to pick Lowell Weicker, <laughs> uh, who was even more improbable in a Republican from Connecticut. But, but President uh, Ford yeah, says to when he learns, he says, you're pulling my leg, which is a very Jerry Ford thing to say, right? You're pulling my leg. Well, no, I mean, it, it was unbelievable. And it did backfire. Uh, there's no doubt that, um, you know, there was a Hail Mary. John Sears was given to, you know, to that sort of thing. Um, but in the, it, it, almost to me, the idea was basically that we could we could ship the Pennsylvania delegation uh, that Drew was was in charge of by picking a Pennsylvania. And within hours, they knew that uh, it, it not only wouldn't work, but they had offended a lot of conservatives. Who yeah, were there, I, I you want know, to. But you mentioned John Sears. You at one point saying here, I'm looking at my outline that John Sears manipulated the media's desire for a longer race. By, sure. by pretending sure. that Ronald Reagan was in it. Meanwhile, Jerry Ford is inviting Mississippi delegates to the Queen Elizabeth State Dinner. You know, it's, it's really blow it's, by blow. It's a fabulous account of 76, Richard. It's an amazing campaign. And it's, it's funny, only now, I suppose, uh, is a lot of this material available. You know, I interviewed 165 people for this book. But then in addition, I got access to all uh, dozens of, of interviews that were done uh, with Ford and and for Ford's memoir, his ghostwriter went out and talked to 50 people with the understanding that nothing they said would ever be, you know, available to the public. Well, you know, so much for that. I mean, I'm in any event, it it, it draws upon um, a, a great number of sources that simply haven't been available until now. Yeah, every, everything has changed since then. I mean, Michigan politics are different. The Detroit Convention is different. Uh, the way yeah. that we treat addiction is different because of Betty Ford. And I, boy, that's a riveting and heartbreaking scene, the intervention. Yeah. And any, any family yeah. ready to do an intervention might profit by reading An Ordinary Man because Jerry and the kids have to go and they have to do it the old-fashioned way. And if someone says heroin addicts at least got some time to warm up to it, kicking the presidency was really tough. And on top yeah. of kicking the presidency... He has to help Betty Ford off of drugs and, and barbiturates, and it's a well, an alcohol. It's a just a racking. There's a lot more drama in this. That, that's the thing that surprised me. I mean, I thought I knew him pretty well. He honored me, asking me to deliver the final eulogy at his funeral in Grand Rapids. Uh, but I'm telling you, I learned a whole lot of things that I didn't know, and I suspect probably a few of them he probably didn't intend for me to know. Uh, well, I didn't know he would throw his glasses at the University of Michigan game. And, you know, for the last few years of his life, Ohio State was always stomping on the Wolverines. So yeah. that's... He, he, he said the, the one thing he inherited from his birth father was a temper. And a friend of mine, he described him as 98% teddy bear and 2% grizzly. But yeah. You never knew when the 2% was going to emerge. He spent a lifetime, like Dwight Eisenhower, uh, controlling his temper. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I, I told my wife last night, Richard, as I was preparing for this, I said, the funniest story in here, I don't know if I'll tell it, but I'll tell it now. I don't know how to eat a tamale either because I'm from Ohio. <laughs> we don't have tamales yeah. in Ohio. So tell that story. Cause I think I'd forgotten it, well, and it's hilarious. Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, there was a mistake. I mean, Ford should have realized. Remember, the Panama Canal Treaty time. Yes. Reagan was really riding a crest, and Texas was made for Reagan, and it was a Democratic crossover state, so all the Wallace voters, you know, had the option of voting for Reagan. Um, and Stu Spencer said, biggest mistake he ever made, he poured something like $300,000, you know, into a Texas primary. Well, it was also um, Ford, this is classic Ford, on the eve of the Texas primary, he sends Henry Kissinger to Africa to announce a 180 degree change in American policy toward Africa. No more support for white minority governments beginning in Rhodesia and yep. basically sending a message to South Africa that basically the, the days of apartheid, you know, are numbered. The, the problem is uh, this may be great policy. It may be due policy. 
but it's not going to win your votes in the Texas Republican primary. And he was warned by Jim Baker, by, you know, Dick Cheney and everyone else. And, you know, typical of Jerry Ford, he went ahead. He goes down there to campaign. George W. Bush told me the story, the famous Tamale incident where, hey, he was from Michigan. He didn't know about tamales. <laughs> I know, I know, so, I know. You know, so he's, you know, he takes, doesn't take the shuck off and he tries to eat it. And, of course, the media even then, let's face it, uh, that incident, which, of course, was pictured, got more attention than anything else in his campaign. It <laughs> defined him in a way, you know. And it played into the notion, this is a nice guy, good old Gary, but is he quite up to the job? And, and that was the, the thing he had to deal with almost more than anything else. But you know what he didn't get credit for, Richard? Uh, Winston Churchill said to be shot at without effect is exhilarating. He was oh, yeah. shot at by Squeaky Fromm, Sarah Jane Moore, and when the golf ball hits his retirement office in Rancho Mirage, he dives for the floor. So yeah, honestly, yeah, I didn't know that. I, this is riveting. I didn't know about Oliver Sippel's tragic end either. Uh, Absolutely. It's a, so you spent 10 years because there's a lot to research here. There's a lot more than I thought there was. And, um, you know, there, it was like, you know, you, you go down one cul-de-sac and, and discover it led to another. And I, I was never felt lost, but I did feel like I was on a, well, you know, I, I thought long and hard, Hugh, because, you know, I was reasonably close to him, whether I knew I could be objective. I knew that. But whether, you know, readers would accept me as objective. And I had lunch with David McCullough, who said, uh, write what you know. And the irony, of course, is that, mean I, that meant I spent 10 years discovering all the things I didn't know. Oh, yeah. And by the way, I don't know how you found out some of this. The presidential chair. Okay, the presidential chair comes up at least twice in here. Once when Jerry Ford is first president, he sits on the sofa. And I've been in the Oval with presidents uh, a few times. And you never (laughs) sit. The president never sits on the sofa. He sits in the presidential chair and you can arrange yourself on the right or the left and in the sofa or the chair adjacent. And you do. But he sits on the sofa with guests until Ronald Reagan is president. And he yes. gives the presidential chair to Jerry that, Ford. What a detail, well, Richard. But, but, but see, Ford, yeah, well, Ford was a congressman. Critical to understanding the Ford presidency. He had to, in some ways, unlearn leadership as defined on Capitol Hill and learn to be an executive. They're two complete, as you know, they're two completely different functions. And yet at the same time, the, the personal qualities that he had, he had developed on the Hill were, were the qualities that allowed him to establish lifelong relationships with world leaders. Uh, people, I mean, G-Scard and, um, and, and Jim Callahan, people with whom you would not, uh, Pierre Trudeau, you know, who you would not uh, believe had a close association. Um, but long after he left office, you know, these people used to get together every year out in Vail. Um, and, you know, so it, it was in some ways the best of a Congress. Well, it, you know, there is a parallel with what we're going through right now. I mean, you've got a president who basically is a product of Capitol Hill, um, who's not going to set anyone afire with his with his rhetoric, but who, because of all those years on Capitol Hill, he knows what buttons to push. He, you know, yeah. and, he knows and how to win South Carolina with James Clyburn. You bet. Well, and the thing is, it probably will look better 30 or 40 years from now than it does at the time. But let me go to a when, – when, when you read a book like this to interview an author, I write down the notes of things that I, I know nobody knows, and I want them to know about it because I didn't know it. In 1950, his first term representing Michigan's 5th District, a young Jerry Ford's car is stolen from a downtown Grand Rapids parking lot. And they find the kid. Take it from there. I, I just think this is so Ford. Well, it, it is so Ford. And in some ways, it's a forerunner of a much larger act of forgiveness, uh, for which he is well known. Uh, anyway, yeah, this kid, you know, it's 1950, and it's, yeah, frankly, he's campaigning for, you know, for re-election. And uh, they find out this kid sort of went on a joyride. He was about to enroll in the military. And I guess he just invited some friends and they probably had a few drinks and went out on the town. Anyway, they found the kid. They found the car. Uh, Ford didn't press charges. Not only did he not press charges, he said, uh, you know, he, he didn't want to be responsible for preventing a, a young man from serving his country in uniform. Yeah. 
I just think that's a fabulous Ford anecdote. <laughs> it's very revealing. It's uh, you know what you know. Those are the values yeah. that, that he uh, he was taught, and that in many ways he he brought to the White House. Um, Penultimate and, question before I go to the pardon, because I want people are waiting for the pardon, so I'm making them wait sure. for the pardon. I want to talk about Mel Laird. Because, honest to goodness, Roger, uh, 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 Richard, I have never thought about Mel Laird other than he was a first-term sec def, and, and I don't know him. Right. He is in, he's everywhere in this book. And yeah, I had yeah. no idea he was like king of Burning Tree and of, of Jerry Ford's presidency. He's everywhere. The, um, there's a great line. Um, actually, Bob Dole, who knew him very well, had a lot in common with him said Mel Laird was the kind of guy who would put poison in the well and then ride down into town and promise to save everyone. Uh, <laughs> he, 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 he was the ultimate schemer, the ultimate leaker. I mean, probably there was no one in Washington in recent history who, who knew, again, which buttons to push. Um, and he, he was, for example, he was insisting that Ford make – well, he was insisting that Nixon pick Ford as vice president. Nixon wanted John Conway. Yes. Well, Conway couldn't get, couldn't get confirmed. You know, recent party switcher, all of that. And so somewhat reluctantly, Nixon refers to Ford in a telephone conversation that I'm sure he never thought would be discovered as an, an honest Truman, which I don't think he meant as a particular compliment, although – us listening to it today. Think That's a great a, compliment. Yeah, it's a great compliment. Exactly. In any event, Ford was sort of foisted off on. It. Although they had had a long, genuine, you know, as much as you have in politics, you know, a, a friendship. Um, and for example, in 1962, when Nixon lost the governorship in California, ABC did this astonishing program called the political obituary of Richard Nixon, in which Alger Hiss you know, it was on camera uh, pronouncing oh, um, wow. the political demise. And the one Republican they could get to go on the show to, A, defend Nixon and, B, insist that Nixon's political career was not over was Jerry Ford. And, yeah. and Nixon appreciated that, genuinely appreciated that. So there, well, the, you know, there, there, there was that, you know. The story of the Martin. airplane lied to the Sadat funeral. I've known about that forever. Oh. I also didn't know that Brent Scowcroft thought it was awful for Nixon to go to China in 76. I thought the opposite was yeah. true. But, but uh, <laughs> you know, there's just yeah. stuff throughout here. But let's go to the two parts of the pardon that people, I think, are so relevant yeah. to today. First, there's yeah. the Agnew option. I wrote about this for The Post, that if Jack Smith has a couple of indictments on the president in his hand, uh, former President Trump, and goes down to Mar-a-Lago and says, I'm going to convict you and you're going to federal prison unless you agree to get out. The Agnew option looms. Uh, and that is detailed here, stuff I never knew. And like, I didn't know Jerry Ford knew about it six months earlier, and, and I didn't know about the specifics of the charge, and you detail all the corruption in Maryland and how Agnew took the briefcases of money. And then the pardon and how complicated it was to come up with. Would you review those two things for listeners? Well, yeah, it is true. I, I, it's funny because, <clears throat> as I say, probably the historical bombshell in the book is a, is a re, a re, a revision, really, of the whole Agnew story. <clears throat> I had one source, but I wouldn't have run with one source, even though I believed him. And then I had a second source who actually, neither of them have talked in 50 years. The second source was the uh, press secretary to the attorney general, Richard Kleindienst. Oh, yeah. Who confirmed that he learned about this at a lunch early in February 1973. Uh, they got on the phone. Findings got on the phone to the White House. So the White House knew. So that's the other thing. Until now, we thought that the White House knew in April of 73. They actually knew at least two months earlier than that. Um, so the, the whole Agnew thing um, it is, is fascinating in its own right that. Uh, from the beginning, uh, the Democrats were going to control. This was the first time, remember, that the uh, constitutional amendment had been applied, that we had to fill a vice president. But the Democrats had heavy majorities, and Ford very shrewdly told President Nixon when he asked that basically they would decide the rules. And um, what he didn't tell Nixon was that he had already talked with his counterparts uh -huh. on the Democratic side, and it was pretty clear uh, who they were going to recommend to the president. And Nixon really was boxed in at that point. 
politically, uh, so weakened politically, that he uh, he really had. I mean, he was perfectly okay with Ford. In fact, he made, and you and I may disagree on this. I think the biggest misjudgment of his career. He he thought that Ford, as vice president, was his insurance. He thought that good old Jerry would not pass muster with his congressional colleagues, which was a total misreading of Congress. Um, it, the truth was just the opposite. Uh, Tip O'Neill, the night that Ford was sworn in with President Nixon uh, in, <clears throat> before a joint session of Congress, Tip O'Neill says it was a very impressive ceremony. We won't see the like of it for maybe another six or seven months. Huh. <laughs> I remember that anecdote. I didn't write it down. But you know, when he when he when he weighed the decision, he had advisors saying, "Wait until after the election." Wait, but he just weighed the oh, decision, yeah. and this yes. should play into Jack Smith and everybody else. If you try a former president or a current president, you are asking yes. for terrible trouble in the country. Ford and and it's interesting now. There's hindsight. You know, Ford's being blamed almost for the wrongdoing of. Of later presidents, it is if you know Ford shouldn't have pardoned Nixon because the uh, Clinton or Trump or you know whatever. Anyway, the fa- you, you've got to put yourself in his shoes. In August of September of 1974, he's in this job that he never aspired to. He discovers there's an economy that is going south rapidly. The NATO alliance is coming unglued. Portugal already has a communist government, yep. uh, and it goes on and on and on. Okay, he's got to pick a vice president. Um, and, you know, so and he finds 25 percent of his time every day is being devoted to Richard Nixon's tapes, Richard Nixon's papers, Richard Nixon's legal prospects. For whatever it's worth, Ford believed personally that if the process was allowed to roll forward, that Nixon would be indicted and probably convicted on obstruction of justice charges. However, he had to weigh that against the obsession, the unhealthy obsession that the media and in many ways the country had on this unprecedented melodrama. And he wasn't trying to forgive Nixon so much with the pardon. He was trying to forget Nixon. He was trying to, to refocus the country's attention on the problems of the economy, et cetera, et cetera. And the only way he could do it <clears throat> was basically through a pardon. Now, you, there are lots of ways. Uh, there are lots of objections you can raise. There are some people who object to the whole part morally. There are a lot of people who will object to it tactically. Why didn't he wait until after the midterm elections? Uh, I mean, I think that's a perfectly legitimate question. Um, he didn't because this is you can call Ford naive. You know, uh, Bob Hartman said, "Why now? Why? Why? You know." And he said, well, the press will ask. He'd been to a press conference at the end of August. Well all described. They to talk yeah. about, all they wanted to talk about was Nixon. Although it was and only Ford, eight out of 24 questions, right? Well, that's true. Yeah. Ford remembered it as exactly. But he came out of that press conference saying, is this what it's going to be like for the next two years? Critical fact, not known. He had, through back channels, contacted the special prosecutor, Leon Jaworski, who told him it would be at least a year and maybe two years before there could be a trial. So Ford looks down the road. That consumes the rest of his presidency. Takes us, you know, and the country is obsessed. The best evidence that Ford could point to that he did the right thing, 25 years later, with the whole Monica Lewinsky business, we lost a year, a whole year, during which we now know at least there was talk in the White House that Clinton might have been using, willing to use his political capital to tackle entitlements, for example, because he wanted to be a near great president. All right. Well, that went out the window when his survival became dependent upon the left wing. Oh, my God. And impeachment the, consumed the, the Trump presidency. Impeachments well, yeah. destroy everything that they touch. Precisely. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 absolutely. Whatever you think of the merits on the case. It's undeniably true that uh, the country's attention is consumed. And so, in any event, Ford, um, for years, uh, I mean, there's no doubt. People took polls after the 76th election, and about 7% of the electorate said 
uh, they could have voted for Ford, but they wouldn't vote for Ford because of the pardon. Well, this is a guy who, you know, if 9,000 votes had changed hands in Ohio and Hawaii, he would have been elected. You know? Yeah. Uh, I blame so, at the end of this. I blame Earl Butts. I had forgotten this entirely. I mean, oh, Gerald Ford lost Mississippi, and there are lots of reasons yeah. to lose Mississippi, but one of them is having a racist on your staff. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Earl Butts. Uh, his wife is quoted in the book as saying, "Earl Earl lives by the sword and dies by the sword," and uh, that's exactly what happened. I mean, on a plane after the Republican convention. He made it absolutely appalling. Doesn't begin. Yeah, we're not going to repeat it. that. Yeah, no, we're, we're not, not going to repeat. Racist, no, racist remark. And guess who? John Dean happened to be in earshot, uh, reporting for Rolling Stone. And Dean, to his credit, did not name Butts. But you know, enterprising reporters did what they do. And uh, Ford had this very difficult. I mean, it was. The fact of the matter is Earl Butts was very popular with the farm community. And yep. Ford, you know, had some work cut out for him in the farm community. And so he, at, you know, at the height of the campaign, was forced uh, to fire, in effect, or accept his resignation. But, you know, it was one of those situations. In any event, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you can imagine the field day that the media had, um, even if they couldn't necessarily repeat what Butts had said. And... Um, Mississippi was lost by 11,000 votes. And yeah. it turned out to be on election night when Mississippi went to Jimmy Ford, NBC declared Ford had his majority, or rather Carter Jimmy had Carter. his majority. Yep. Yeah. Let, let me close by saying I hope when you talk to Stu Spencer, you ask him if you can confirm. I have quoted Stu Spencer uh, 150, 200 times saying, oh, yeah. that which said in a restaurant is intended to be overheard. I call that the Stu Spencer rule. When people start wanting to talk to me about stuff in a restaurant, I said, remember, Stu Spencer. I don't know if he actually said it. It was told to me that he said it. So you can ask him about that. Richard, what are yeah. your hopes for this book? I, I, you know, and you wrote the Nelson Rockefeller book I talked to you about, An Uncommon Man, Thomas Dewey. You are a specialist in covering people who deserve a biography. Will people well, understand how relevant this book is to today? It, it is astonishingly relevant. I didn't write it thinking that. A, a contemporary uh, document. It was the it's the fifth and final in a forty year series of books that began, as you mentioned, with a biography of Thomas Dewey. Uh, and you can see, I, I basically spent my career writing about dead white males, um, Republicans, a tradition, yeah. a tradition, yeah, a political tradition, a kind of um, you know right of center, moderate, you know what Canadians used to call progressive conservatism, you know. Uh, and um, it's defunct. I mean, I'm, I'm writing about dodos, but hugely admirable. And although the tradition from which they sprang may be relegated to the past, they are remarkably relevant in the. We are not dead. We are quality. still there. Well, I, I really believe that when you mentioned Jim Rhodes a couple of times in this book, I noted that because yeah. I come out yeah. of a Jim Rhodes, Ohio, and Jerry Ford comes out of yep. Michigan. And the Midwestern center right Republic is not dead. They are still and Bob decency, Dole is that tradition. Decency, which came to be seen as almost dull during the four years before it works pretty good right now, doesn't it? It Just does. Dec decency and the willingness to make tough decisions regardless of the short-term political consequences. It's no accident that the, the, the presidents whose portraits Ford chose to hang in his cabinet room were Dwight Eisenhower, Abraham Lincoln, and to the surprise of many, Harry Truman. Oh, interesting. I, I, I remember that detail now. I just thought Ronald Reagan offering Gerald Ford the presidential chair, that's decent. That is so yeah. decent. Well, and how about but then the bizarre story of him offering him the vice presidency yeah, that you know, was... in 1980. I mean, it's just uh, that, again, is a story. It was close. For the first and then time. they called George H.W. Bush, right? They, yeah. And then they just hung up the phone. They spent so much time on Ford, they were left with H.W. There wasn't anybody and, and, else. And we do not know and will never know for sure whether that's exactly the way Ford planned it. But it, there, are, there are real implications that Ford knew exactly what he was doing. 
And he said afterwards he had a good convention, good speech. And he says, I got George Bush vice president. Yeah. Well, Richard, I want to congratulate. An Ordinary Man's a fabulous read. I couldn't put it down. And I don't think it's just because I'm a Midwestern Republican. I think it's because the times we are living in now were formed in the 19... In fact, Kim Strassel has a new book coming out comparing Jimmy Carter to Joe Biden, unfavorably for Joe Biden. And I, I mm. do think there is this echo. It is so loud from 76 to 80 that is underway in the country right now. So loud. And uh, obviously Trump's not Reagan, but a, a response. Uh, Joe Biden is elected in response to uh, Trump. Uh, uh, Jimmy Carter's elected in response to the pardon and Richard Nixon. And then you get another turn right afterwards. And I don't know what's going to come out of this, but I sure think everyone who's thinking about it had better read An Ordinary Man. Well, listen, uh, and it also, but it also does remind us, be careful about assessing presidential performance while someone is still in office. Yes. Or, frankly, for a while after they leave office. Okay, Richard, I mean, you still got 30 years left. I still think you can tackle the Nixon bio. <laughs> uh, I'll leave that to someone else, but thank you. <laughs> Thanks thank, for your interest. It was thank you, Richard. Always good to talk to you. Our favorite presidential historian, Richard Norton Smith. Thank you, Richard. Bye bye. He says, I think it's my brother's birthday. I have to call him up after the show today. Um, not Mycroft, Sherlock. And uh, they're, both of my brothers are older than I, and they're both much smarter than I am. And I am, uh, I think it's Sherlock's birthday, but I got to call him up and find out. I never know. Do you know your siblings' birthdays? I don't know my siblings' birthdays. All right, there's one huge story which is Tucker Carlson leaving Fox. There's a minor story, Don Lemon leaving CNN. And then there's an enormous story in China. And I got a great interview with a book about a man from 45 years ago that is as relevant to today as any book about anything 45 years ago can be. It's this book. Richard Norton Smith is one of America's preeminent presidential biographers. He's written a book about Gerald Ford. And the nominating contest against Reagan in 1976 and the election against Carter in 1976 is so absolutely relevant to what we are doing today, that especially Ronald Reagan picking Richard Schweiker to be his running mate in 76 in a Hail Mary and Gerald Ford picking Bob Dole. I, we're going to talk all about that with Richard in hour three. Let me begin, if I can, with one story and then a commentary about Tucker. The story is that, quote, Bud Light suffers staggering 17% sales plunge amid Dylan Mulvaney's controversy. That ties into why Tucker Carlson was so absolutely important and popular in the culture. Now, I myself am never watching TV after 7 p.m. I try to catch Brett Baer. Uh, it's the only show I watch on TV, actually, because after that, it's either show prep or sleep. And I'm still making the train. I didn't watch last night, even though I know Congressman Michael Waltz was going to be on with uh, uh, Barry and Kilmeade was filling in in the slot last night, previously known as Tucker. And I, I was going to watch that, but I just ran out of time and I, I just didn't have enough time to do it because I, I got to get some sleep. And I still am transitioning from East, West Coast to East Coast. So I woke up at 3 a.m. this morning, came down and, and got already got the coffee made and then realized I don't have to go to the studio for two more hours. And went back to bed because that's just what happens when you move coast to coast after three months. But I was thinking about the only thing I tweeted about Tucker yesterday is is that I have no idea what's going on inside of Fox or CNN. It's nobody does. It's all speculation. Nobody has seen the settlement. There are DNAs all around. Nobody knows anything. I know Tucker's being paid a lot of money not to be on TV every night, and I don't know why. And there's a lot of speculation, but I do not know why. I do know why Bud Light lost 17% of its sales, because they were obliging beer drinkers to join their political statement. And this applies left, right. Do not make your customers join a political statement they do not want to make. It's that simple. Do not make your customers join a political statement. If you're looking, my show looks for 5% of the 100%, not 100% of the 1%. There are different kinds of shows. Tucker wanted, one, and he got 100% of the 
All right, so he got it all. He was the most successful cable show host in America, by far, by far, not close. And that's not the audience that anybody else on cable looks for, which is the Trump audience, the former President Trump audience. And Donald Lemon had no audience. All right, so there's complete difference. I don't know why Don Lemon left either. Uh, off air, I've had many, many exchanges over the years with Tucker, and he's not a friend. His father gave me my start in broadcasting, but I'd see Tucker around D.C., and I and when he had his own shows previously in different networks, I, I appeared with him, and he's always been a gentleman. I'm looking forward to seeing him up north this summer, and I have nothing but great things to say about his intellect. We did not agree on everything, but his intellect is genuine and big. Don Lemon uh, could be very difficult to be with on air, very difficult. Nice guy off air, just very difficult on air because he was looking for the endorphins that come from controversy. And that's a bad thing to need. It's a bad thing to need to be in the headlines. I, I think maybe Jeff Zucker built that into him when he made him a star. And Chris Lick doesn't want that. And I, But I don't know. It's all, I don't know anything. You don't know anything. You, Unless you're a lawyer in the room at Dominion, unless you're an executive at Fox, you don't know anything. I'm not going to speculate on it. I am going to speculate, though, that when I just put this out on Twitter, if you want to see the full list or you hear this list and, and you want to know what did he just say, who did he just mention, you can go over to my Twitter account. I do know that Donald Trump is likely to be re-nominated. It's not inevitable. It's a long way from then until now. And from now until then is what I meant to say. It's a long, long time. We don't know whether the former president will stay in. We don't know how Ron DeSantis will do. We don't know if Nikki Haley or Tim Scott will catch fire. We do not know that Governor DeSantis is even going to run. He's in Japan today, by the way. We don't know any of these things. And many things happen during a campaign. One of the things I'm going to talk about with Richard Norton Smith is how incoming destroys the campaign. But here's my phone number, 1-800-520-1234. And here is my tweet. This AM. Will Tucker challenge Senator Angus King, independent Maine, in 2024? Tucker is very smart and would raise a ton of contributions. But King is very popular, but also 80 years old. Tucker could easily start a new venture, as Megyn Kelly did with her very successful podcast. He will almost certainly be on the great mentioners' long list of former, Vice President, uh, of former President Trump's possible picks for BP, which, if Trump is renominated, will include Governor DeSantis. Now, the no two nominees from the same state rule will be harder to avoid here than with Vice President Cheney and former President Bush, because you're not allowed to have a nominee from the same state for president and vice president. And in 2000, uh, Vice President Cheney re-registered in Wyoming, and everyone knew that that's where he was from. It was fine. I suppose President Trump could re-register in New York because he's up at Bedminster all the time. Uh, so it might not be insufferable for Governor DeSantis to run with Donald Trump. Vice President, uh, I mean, Ambassador Nikki Haley could be it. Senator Tim Scott and serious national security folks like former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, former National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien, former Ambassador to Germany and Acting DNI Rick Grinnell, Senator Tom Cotton, Congressman Mike Gallagher, or a traditional pick like Iowa's Governor Kim Reynolds, South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem, or New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu. Perens. Yes, some are white men like Trump, and some have said harsh things about the former president. But when it comes to winning, you pick whomever you think will help. If the GCCP threat grows even more ominous, think a NATSEC vice president who can take it to Biden-Harris day after day. And that's the end of my tweet. Now, that list is not exhaustive, but it's what could fit in my expanded tweet range. And I'd like to know what you think about Tucker as VP or any of these other people. 1-800-520-1234. Or whether you think Tucker should run against Angus King in Maine. That's where he lives. That's his residence. And uh, he might also have a residence in Florida, but he ain't running for senator in Florida. He can easily run in Maine. He's been, he's been going to Maine forever. Spends a lot of time in Maine as a studio in Maine. And Tucker would carry all of northern Maine. Now, I know Maine a little bit because I spent four months there last summer. I'm going back this summer. My brother-in-law and sister-in-law are up there, and I just, the fetching Mrs. Hewitt loves it. I loved it, too. The grandkids love it. My kids love it. 
And so I spent a lot of time, and I talked to a lot of people. It is my habit. Tucker would sweep, sweep, sweep everything north of Portland. Uh, maybe not Freeport, but everything north of L.L. Bean is Tucker land. I mean, everything. And then everything south of Portland is Tucker land. And it's a, you know, Susan Collins wins there handily. Handily. Angus Ken, King wins handily. Uh, I just wonder whether or not he'll do that, or if he's going to wait, do a podcast, something easy, just do a podcast for a while. And I don't even know what the contract says. Maybe he can't do a podcast while you're getting paid by, by Fox. You might have a, oh, sure, you can do a podcast, but we're not going to pay you the balance of your contract. That's not a good, wise move. I don't know if he's allowed to write anywhere. Uh, I don't know what he's going to be able to do, but I would like to ask you, 1-800-520-1234, 1-800-520-1234. America, I am uh, I'm here to tell you Joe Biden is running for re-election. He just dropped his video. Let's listen to what the president said. Freedom, personal freedom, is fundamental to who we are as Americans. There's nothing more important, nothing more sacred. That's been the work of my first term, to fight for our democracy. This shouldn't be a red or blue issue. To protect our rights, to make sure that everyone in this country is treated equally and that everyone is given a fair shot at making it. But you know, around the country, MAGA extremists are lining up to take on those bedrock freedoms. Cutting Social Security that you've paid for your entire life while cutting taxes for the very wealthy. Dictating what health care decisions women can make. Banning books and telling people who they can love. All while making it more difficult for you to be able to vote. When I ran for president four years ago, I said we're in a battle for the soul of America, and we still are. The question we're facing is whether in the years ahead, we have more freedom or less freedom, more rights or fewer. I know what I want the answer to be, and I think you do too. This is not a time to be complacent. That's why I'm running for re-election, because I know America. I know we're good and decent people. I know we're still a country that believes in honesty, respect, and treating each other with dignity. That we're a nation where we give hate no safe harbor. We believe that everyone is equal, that everyone should be given a fair shot to succeed in this country. Thank you for choosing us. For every generation of Americans has faced a moment when they have to defend democracy. Stand up for our personal freedom. Stand up for the right to vote and our civil rights. And this is our moment. We defeat the so if you're with me, go to JoeBiden.com and sign up. Let's finish this job. I know we can. Because this is the United States of America. There's nothing, simply nothing we cannot do if we do it together. No joke. That's it. Come back. No joke. No joke. No joke. No, that's it. Uh, I'm not kidding. No joke. That was it. Uh, A series of cliches, wonderful pictures of Americans about the eight, nine, ten different quick cuts to the president not falling over and not being lost on the stage, not live and not truthful in many, many respects. But it's not about Joe Biden. It's about who do the Republicans nominate and what do they run on? Because Joe Biden is can be beaten by anyone currently in the list. By the way, Kamala Harris is all over the video, all over it. 
Not impossible that he would dump her. Not likely. Not impossible and not likely. So let me go back to my question. Uh, Tucker for vice president. Rudy in South Carolina, what do you think? Uh, no, I don't think, I'm not sure if he would be a good vice president, although he's, he's, he's kind of sui generis, a class unto himself. And I mean that not in a disparaging sense, but in a sense that he has a unique ability to see, you're kind of in that category at times too, has a unique ability to see things that in make them known to the public that makes them so popular. Well, I, I, I think being uh, forceful, articulate and intelligent is a good thing. He's what, 52 or 53? He's the perfect age. Thank you, Rudy. Stewart in Ohio. What do you think, Stewart? I think the simplest answer, if you can hear me okay, the simplest I can. answer is that it's going to be financial. It's either going to be he's going to strike out on his own. and uh, I'm asking about Vice President, it. though. I, so you don't think he's right. going to run? Well, okay. I don't think he will. I guess there's a small chance he will because it's the kind of thing that I that I think Donald Trump would go for. Exactly. Um, but this is the, the, the choice is up to one person, the nominee. It's up to one exactly. person. Exactly. Yeah. And and I, so I think it's possible. I just don't think it's likely. Yeah. Okay. Well said. And, and, in and my list. Vote, thank you, Stuart. Oh, you, I know. I think he would bring out the base. I think he would bring in gazillions of dollars. And I think he'd be a terrific campaigner like Bob Dole was. I think what people have to realize is that Donald Trump doesn't play by the old rules. That's why he might, if we are in a national security showdown and he's thinking ahead to the, to the debate against Kamala Harris, the most inarticulate and confused vice president of my lifetime, and you put Mike Pompeo, Tom Cotton, Mike Gallagher up there on national security, or you put up Rick Grinnell, or you put up Tucker Carlson, they will cut her to shreds. Uh, however, I don't think the Biden-Harris team are going to agree to debates. Let's put that down for April 25th, twenty. 23. I don't think they're going to agree. They've got no upside. Stay tuned, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Welcome back, America. Breaking news. Statue is defaced in England after children were given crayons. I, I want to precede this story by telling you Genghis Kate was not out of the country. Repeat, Genghis Kate was not out of the country. Bright blue crayon marks were found on a statue that is more than two centuries old at a conservation site in England after activity packs with crayons were handed out to children at the property, officials said, and the New York Times reports. The statute and a memorial were defaced this month at Croom, a 700-acre property that is home to a mansion and two castles, as well as violets, two bell, tulips, and bluebells. The National Trust, the conservation society that oversees sprawling grounds near High Ground, England, High Green, England, which is 135 miles northwest of, of London, said it did not know how the marks came to be, or if they came from crayons that were handled at the site. Like lots of other heritage organizations, we regularly run events for families, and we often issue pencils or crayons, the organization said in a statement. On April 8th, Easter weekend, bright blue marks were scrawled across the face, arms, and torso of the Sabrina statue, a depiction of a water nymph by sculptor John Bacon from the 1780s or 1802. The exact date is disputed, of course. The statue, no one has paid much attention to this statue in 300 years. The statue is in a grotto on the property near a lake, an end point for Croom River, which winds through the grounds. The stone statue is about six feet long. A memorial to the landscape artist Lancelot Brown, also known as Capability Brown. That's my nickname. That's interesting. Capability Hugh is my nickname. Capability Brown was also defaced with long, messy blue zigzag crayon marks. <laughs> Not Kate. Uh, I have Bethany and Mary Catherine coming up today's show. I'm going to check on whether they were out of the country because they've got Kate's as well. I'm just going to check on that. Let me check on the markets right now. Brought to you by Birch Gold. Uh, yesterday, I, if you bought gold, nothing much happened. It's still at $1,992 an ounce. Birch Gold is available at hugold.com. Hugold.com. That's where I buy my gold. That's where you should go if you want to open up an IRA or a SEP IRA or a 401k. Birch Gold will send you a free information pack, teach you how to do um, that in a way that is consistent with IRS rules so that money grows in value tax-free. And you ought to know that gold keeps its value even in inflationary times. Over 100 years, it has outpaced inflation. I read that not long ago, and I said, you know, people need to hear that. 
Some stocks go to zero, like GM when it went bankrupt. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond went to zero, bankrupt this week. Uh, gold never goes bankrupt, my friends. Never, ever goes bankrupt. In fact, a lot of central governments are buying gold right now. And so if you want to make sure that the nest egg doesn't go to zero, you buy dirt, meaning real estate, or you buy gold or both, and you don't sell them. You put them away and put them in a, if you're just buying gold, put it in a safety deposit box. Don't keep it at home. And if you uh, want to save an IRA or 401k, go to hugold.com and ask for the free information pack. The Dow is up 32, the S&P up 3, and the NASDAQ down 35. It's earnings week. So Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, they all report this week. So markets are just going to tread water, except for the speculators and the traders. But gold stays right where it was, 1,992. No big moves with gold. It goes up, it goes up, and it goes up. Not endlessly, in keeping with markets, obviously, in demand, but it just doesn't go to zero, ever. I want to go back to the phones. I, uh, if you're just joining us, I don't know anything about Tucker, and I don't know anything about Don Lemon. Nobody does. A thousand million tweets, like a million three hundred and forty thousand tweets about Tucker yesterday after his departure from Fox was announced and negotiated over the weekend. I don't know why. You don't know why. And it's all speculation. And people are using this opportunity to tee off on Tucker. Shame on you. You have no idea what you're writing about. Three million people a night watched him. That's one percent of America. He had 100% of 1%, and that 1% changed over the week. So I like to say he had 100% of the 3%. And while I did not agree with, with many of his takes, I did agree with a lot of them. And I do believe that if you're Donald Trump, actually, the former president commented on this yesterday, cut number one. Well, I'm shocked. I'm surprised. Uh, he's a very good person, a very good man, and very talented, as you know. And he had very high ratings. So... Uh, we're just learning about it almost as we speak. You and I just said, wow, that was something. That's a big one. Uh, I don't know if it was voluntary or was it uh, was somebody fired. But I think Tucker's been uh, terrific. He's been, especially over the last year or so, he's been terrific to me. There's a lot of turmoil over there, Fox. I mean, 787 yeah. they just paid. Why would they get rid of a guy who's performing? Why would somebody do that to their business? Because they're, they're losing money right now. Their stock has gone down. Well, I was surprised that they made a settlement on that case. I thought that was a case that uh, should easily be won. And they made a settlement. Look, you'll have to ask them. I'm not, I'm not representing yeah. them at all by any, by any means. But the Tucker uh, situation, again, you don't know if it's a firing. Maybe he left because he wasn't being given his free reign. He wants free reign, maybe. But... Uh, I was surprised by it. But, you know, that's a very interesting insight by the former president. Maybe it was editorial. Maybe they said, we're going to write your monologues. Uh, you know, it's just all speculation. Like the NFL draft is Thursday night. I don't know where C.J. Stroud is going to go. I hope he goes number one overall. I think he's got a touch like very few people. Uh, Bryce Harper's 5'10", 5'11". I just can't see it. Tried that with other quarterbacks, and it rarely works. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. But CJ, you know, but it's all speculative. I'm not a GM. You don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know who the Browns are going to draft in round three. I hope they give Bubba Ventrone all the picks and just say, make the special teams better. He's their new assistant head coach and special teams uh, coordinator. I just, I just wish people would realize when they don't know things. I do know. That when it comes time to pick a vice president, if Donald Trump is the nominee, he's going to think long and hard about Tucker. Because remember when John McCain threw the Hail Mary on the advice of Steve Schmidt and Nicole Wallace and picked Sarah Palin? They did so because they wanted some juice. A vice presidential nominee matters three times. The day you announce, the day they give their speech, and the night of the debate, if there is a debate. There is also the outside chance that a swing state can be brought in, which is why you might reach, for example, for Chris Sununu, even though he says bad things about Donald Trump. You put all that aside. George H.W. Bush said Ronald Reagan invented voodoo economics. He still ended up on the ticket. Uh, it can be a great surprise. Two white men, George W. Bush and Dick Cheney. 
it can be a diversity pick, Kamala Harris with vice, uh, with President Biden. It can be Jerry Ford negotiating with Ronald Reagan in 1976 and Ronald Reagan negotiating with Jerry Ford in 1980. It doesn't work out. It can be any, you know, Mitt Romney surprises with Paul Ryan, old and young. So Donald Trump will be, what, 78? Maybe he goes for the young and dapper Tucker Carlson. So there's no, no bow ties, but get out there. Or maybe Tucker runs for president. Man, he's very, very smart. Uh, I do think the IQ of television went down yesterday. I can count on two hands the number of genuinely smart people on cable. Genuinely smart people. Not reading prompter. And Tucker is one of them, was one of them, maybe in the future one of them. But I don't watch the show because I, I, I just don't know. And I, I don't think anyone should speculate on it because they don't know either. But I, you can speculate on who would make a good vice president. I go back to my Twitter list and the, the list I put out there is preliminary. Who might, if Donald Trump is the nominee, who might he pick? And it would include. Governor DeSantis, even if Governor DeSantis runs against him, and they'd have to figure out the no two people from same state rule, I imagine the former president would re-register in New York. Ambassador Haley and Senator Scott, a lot of people think they're running for vice president. Uh, If you need a national security person, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, former National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien, former Ambassador to Germany and Acting DNI Rick Grinnell, Senator Tom Cotton, Congressman Mike Gallagher, or, you know, you go for a governor. You know, Kim Reynolds from Iowa, South Dakota's Christine Nome, New Hampshire's Chris Sununu. And some of those people are like Trump white males, but that's a fixation. You know, nobody votes for or against a vice president. It just, look, Kamala Harris helped out the president, maybe marginally, in the states where he needed a few thousand votes from the African-American community. And so there is an argument for a diversity pick just on that basis. But if we're in a a showdown with China and it's gotten hot or cold, deep, deep cold or very, very hot, then you head over and you pick someone like Tom Cotton, Mike Gallagher, Mike Pompeo. Uh, I'll go back to your call. Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. David Drucker knows a lot of different stuff. And the senior political correspondent for the dispatch joins me. Good morning, David. Good morning, Hugh. All right, Drucker. Uh, Tucker for Senate, Maine, 2024. What do you think? Well, look, I think anything's possible, but, uh, you know, I, I t- well, let me just say this. I'm, I'm not inside Tucker's brain, so who the heck knows what he's going to do after the dust settles. Uh, he's always played that, listen, I'm not a serious person. I'm just a TV host. I just entertain people. I don't really mean like any Rush of this did. stuff. I don't really not mean it, but... So I, I guess it's possible. He just he tends to dabble and not act like he really wants to be responsible politically for the views that he discusses by his own admission. I'm not judging here. This is what he says. So I, it's possible, but 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 I don't know. Look, you don't have to be responsible and be in the United States Senate. I mean, that's like the last well, that's thing true, you have but to he, be. It... <laughs> listen, Hugh, he might be too young. All right, he might be too young for the Senate. <laughs> All right. All right so wait. I also give him 20 years, give him 20 years. I also want to read you my tweet. Tucker could easily start a new venture for Megan Kelly, as she did, or he will be on the great mentioners long list of former Vice President Trump's possible picks for BP, which, if Trump is renominated, will include Governor DeSantis, Ambassador Haley, Senator Scott and serious national security folks like Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. National Security Advisor, Ambassador Robert O'Brien, Ambassador to Germany, Acting DNI Rick Grinnell, Senator Tom Cotton, Congressman Mike Gallagher, or a traditional pick like Governor Kim Reynolds, South Dakota Governor Christy Noem, or New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu. I go on to explain why all the naysayers have got to stop saying nay, because it's Donald Trump, he can pick whoever he wants. What do you think about under ticket? I don't think he's going to run for president. I joked about that yesterday. That's not a that's not something you want to do if you're Tucker Carlson. Listen, but, I, I will tell you. I will tell you, Hugh, when I was researching in Trump's shadow, I mean, I had I had operatives on the po- in the populist wing of the party tell me that they'd like to see Tucker run for president, and they thought that they could generate 
uh, some really good super PAC funding from for him. So while I agree with you, I don't think he will run. I don't think he wants to run. I think there are people um, in certain quarters of the party on the populist right, the national nationalist populist right, that would love to see a Tucker candidacy because because they believe he's more authentic in espousing their views than Donald Trump is. Now, as to who Trump picks for, for his vice presidential nominee, if he is the nominee, I would expect him to pick somebody who is similar to him and not necessarily uh, yin to his yang the way Mike Pence was. And I think it's because, especially if he wins the nomination again, after everything that we have seen, he will believe that his formula works and that his base, as he once told me in 2019, is far bigger than people think and big enough to get him across the finish line in the Electoral College, if not the popular vote, which obviously uh, doesn't determine things. And so I would look away from some of the candidates that have voiced opposition to Trump over the years on the Republican side and look more towards those who fit within his fold. Well, that's why I include, and people roll their eyes, former Secretary of State Pompeo, former National Security Advisor and Brian, former Ambassador to Germany and acting DNI Grinnell. These are known quantities to the president that also secure the national security base very, very strongly. And uh, you also lean into the Afghanistan thing with Pompeo. But I don't rule out anybody because... Donald Trump would decide. It's, I've been reading this book, An Ordinary Man, which takes me back to my first presidential campaign in 1976 when I'm a college kid. And Reagan considered, I mean, Ford considered picking Reagan. And Reagan said, I'll have Richard Schweiker. Not, it's all open, right? You can get up with a Sarah Palin you've never heard of. Or you can have George H.W. Bush added to Reagan after calling him voodoo economic. It's completely up to the nominee. Well, it is up to the nominee, though. I wonder if the party having less influence than it used to would have less of the candidate of the nominee's ear, right? I mean, in these years past, there were all these factions that you had to satisfy and the party was strong. And so you couldn't ignore the party apparatus and the other prominent figures within the party because voters would go with them. But I don't know that Trump as the nominee, I mean, not only has he really never cared about the party, and he, he, if anything, he's just bent the party to his will. I, I don't know that there would be much of a party. I, I don't know if the, the other quarters of the party would have much influence over him because he, not only would he yep. assume he doesn't need them, the party just doesn't have that kind of strength the way it used to decades ago. OK, you have, you have less than a minute. Throw your dart. If Trump is nominated again, who does he pick to be under his ticket? Well, the first name that comes to mind for me is uh, Mike Pompeo. He's a former congressman, former director of the CIA under Trump, a former secretary of state under Trump. He is young. He is broadly accepted uh, by by multiple sectors of the party. And I could see that sort of a ticket selling and their working relationship was good. What we don't know is what Pompeo may do in the months ahead in terms of endorsing another candidate he thought about running against Trump. And that might, you know, eventually make him unacceptable. Although last time he endorsed Rubio rather vigorously, criticized Trump rather vigorously, and still ended up to be his most trusted cabinet official. Well, that's why I included Pompeo, Robert O'Brien, Rick Grinnell, and Tom Cotton. They all worked well with Donald Trump, very, very closely and well. Uh, always good to see you, David. Byron York is next. Stay tuned, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. There's a lot ahead on today's Hugh Hewitt Show. On a Tuesday from inside the Beltway, as is Byron New York. Good morning, Byron. How are you? Good morning, Hugh. Doing well. All right. My uh, my first tweet this morning uh, is about Tucker leaving, and I'm not going to ask you about that. You're with Fox. I am going to, however, ask you if Donald Trump did what Joe Biden did and pre- preemptively announced he's keeping Kamala Harris via the video. She's in the video a lot and said, Tucker Carlson is going to be my vice president and sent him out to start campaigning and raising money. What would the effect be? You know, I don't know. There, there has been you see in some of the articles about Tucker Carlson uh, the possibility of him running for office. I have, I have, first of all, I have zero idea. I haven't talked to him in God knows probably years. Um, so I have zero idea. But there are, I think, looking. These articles are looking at the example of Pat Buchanan, uh, 
yes. um, who had a different career from uh, Tucker in the sense that he had extensive uh, work in the White House, in the Nixon White House, and then re- later in the Reagan White House, um, but was also, uh, you know, just a, a fabulously uh, agile opinion writer uh, and had been a journalist. So I think they were looking at, at the sort of populist, quote, revolt run by uh, Pat Buchanan, his run against George H. W. Bush. And I think for a lot of Trump's supporters, who uh, for, for whom the Bushes are kind of everything that was wrong about the Republican Party, uh, Pat Buchanan is a, a, a bit of a saint for, for somebody who... Well, remember his line was... Against the Bushes. His line was "Ride to the sound of the guns," and and Pat up in New Hampshire in 1992 did very well. He didn't win, but he did very well. Right. Uh, and I think there are lots of reasons to pick a vice president, but the three big ones are the day of the announcement, the night of the vice presidential acceptance speech, and the debate. That's about it. And raising yep. money. Can they raise money? So I put a long list on Twitter. I don't think Trump's going to be driven by the traditional considerations if he's renominated. I think he could easily put on Pompeo or Cotton or Gallagher or Rick Grinnell, someone that he knows, trusts, and is solid on national security. I think he could go any of a thousand direction. But if he does it early like he did with the Supreme Court nominees, it will be another precedent-breaking. Of course, Richard Schweiker was selected by Ronald Reagan in 76. I'm going to talk to Richard Norton Smith about his Jerry Ford biography, and I'd forgotten that until I read that. So, you know, anything can happen in a, in a VP race. Well, Trump wants, uh, I think his history kind of shows that Trump wants, above all, somebody who will be loyal to him and defend him all the time. Um, it's, I think it matters more to Trump than that person's reputation or their resume or how well-rounded they are in government and, and uh, qualified to take over as president of the United States should uh, Trump uh, die or something like that. I, I, I think loyalty and defending Trump, of course, defending Trump is a particularly uh, important job because he's under attack all the time. So uh, I think he's looking that, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see him do somebody like uh, Carrie Lake, because not because she would be taken seriously as a presidential candidate, uh, but because she would defend him all the time. Well, that, that, that's true. But I also think Pompeo, Cotton, I, I think Tucker would defend him all. I mean, that's the discussion. Who will be Bob Dole to my Jerry Ford, although he's not Jerry Ford? Who will be my attack dog, go after the Democrats and be, you know, actually, you have to be kind of serious on national security. Carrie Lake was a news anchor in Fox uh, in, in Arizona. I, I, I just don't know that she wouldn't make the triad answer even worse than Vivek Ramaswamy's <laughs> when he didn't know what it was. I, I just I just don't think that's that one's up there. So, Byron, let's go back to Donald Trump. You wrote about his trial today. I'm not going to cover the trial very much, but why don't you tell people what's going on? Um, Trump is uh, – there is a uh, lawsuit against Trump alleging – that he committed battery in the form of a rape, uh, and he defamed a, um, a, uh, a woman named E. Jean Carroll, who is now 79 years old, has been a longtime advice columnist at Elle magazine. Uh, she alleges that this took place in either 1995 or 1996. She does not remember specifically when. Uh, well, well past the statute of limitations. Uh, she did not, she, she told two friends about it, she says, and they confirmed that, uh, at the time. But other than that, she stayed completely silent about it, uh, through the years. Uh, we're talking 27 years. And, um, didn't even mention it when Trump started running for president in 2016, and other women accused him of sexual uh, misconduct. And she said her mind was changed by the Me Too movement. But even then, she didn't talk about it until she published a book in 2019, and she included that as kind of the centerpiece of her book. Trump then denied it all, said, uh, this never happened, I've never met her, and she's not my type. So based on that, she goes to a party in Manhattan at Molly Jong Fast's house, and that's she's a, a resistance figure, a writer, and sort of in the resistance. The party was for Kathy Griffin, the comedian, who's another 
resistance figure, uh, and uh, there was George Conway, the uh, the lawyer who was uh, Kellyanne Conway's husband, who had um, had famously been a quote elf back in the Clinton days. Had actually secretly worked as a lawyer helping Paula Jones uh, sue Bill Clinton. And after a conversation with George Conway, um, E. Jean Carroll decided to sue. Donald Trump, and filed suit uh, not all that long after that. One last twist, um, in 2022, New York passed something called the Adult Survivors Act. It was a, uh, a Me Too movement, uh, uh, bill, basically, which said anyone who says they've been sexually assaulted or the victim of sexual abuse gets a one-time only chance to sue their alleged assailant, even if it happened many, many years ago, long before the statute of limitations. Within hours of that bill taking effect, E. Jean Carroll refiled her lawsuit, alleging defamation, but also alleging that he actually raped her. Now, the problem for Trump is there's going to be a trial. It's starting today, and it is in Manhattan. So uh, we've seen the, the, Trump indicted in Manhattan, but now there's actually going to be a trial with a jury in Manhattan, and who knows what happens there. Well, yeah, and that's the last anyone's going to hear about it on this show, because I find it so distasteful and extraordinarily out of of ordinary legal means. I mean, I, I think it violates his due process rights, actually, to bring that lawsuit, that statute. But we'll see. We'll watch. Um, now I want to ask you about probably, other than China, the most significant story of the day, uh, Byron. It's a New York Post headline. Bud Light suffers a staggering 17% sales plunge amid yeah. Dylan Mulvaney controversy. I think this will be on the desk of every CEO and COO and vice president for advertising and brand in the country by the end of the day. What do you think? I totally agree. This is a huge story. It's, uh, what, was the, what was the number again? Was it 17%? 17%. Okay, One and seven. that was up significantly from, I think, 6% the week before. So it appears to be growing. And the, the, what's going on, I think, is not that an organized boycott is taking effect and people are saying, oh, I'm going to join this boycott and go to the website and sign my name. I think what they're saying is they, they go to the convenience store and, and they open the cooler door and they said, eh, I'll, have the, I'll have the Coors, I'll have the Miller. I, I if only not boycott. to get involved in it. If only yeah. to just not be, I don't want to take a side when I draw when I drink beer. I want to drink a beer. I, I want nothing to do with this controversy. This is that's exactly right. Is just to get the politics out of it. Um, I don't. I don't know if you saw the interview the other day with Phil Jackson, the legendary NBA yes. coach. Yes, I did. And he said he doesn't watch the NBA anymore um, because they, you know, they put messages on the on the back of players' uniforms. They put messages along the along the sides of the of the basketball court. It's just there's just too much politics. And he wanted basketball. I mean, he he knows basketball. He wanted basketball without politics. And people want beer without politics too. And I think that's the lesson of this old Dylan Mulvaney. It, it is very much. It's not got anything to do with Dylan Mulvaney. It's with people saying, not my, I don't want to argue about this at dinner. I really don't want to have someone in the bar say, so you're all in favor of that. And boy, that message has got to go. It's a bit of the Disney message. It's a bit of everybody's message. This show is about news and politics. People who tune into it make a choice to learn about news and politics. You write about news and politics. People subscribe to your newsletter or watch you on Fox because they want it. And they want a particular approach, too. We're for fact-driven people. Just but I, a bit outside. Yeah, that was the Dylan Mulvaney with Just a Bit Outside. <laughs> Byron York on Twitter. Follow him there. Follow him at his newsletter over at DC Examiner. And follow me to the next segment right here on the Tuesday Morning Edition. Thank you, Byron, of The Hugh Hewitt Show. Uh, Bethany Mandel is my guest author, co-author of Stolen News. Good morning, Bethany. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am great. Now, Bethany, there's been a statue defaced in England. I just want to know if your your three-year-old was out of the country last week. I saw that, and I was like, well, that's kind of what you get for giving crayons to, to children. You're kind of asking yeah, for it. I'm not even sorry. They were asking for it. And I, just, I assured the audience Genghis Kate was not out of the country. I just was wondering about yours and Mary Catherine Ham's children. Let me ask you, though, about this story. Bethany, because it kind of feeds into stolen youth. Bud Light sta suffers staggering 17% sales plunge 
amid Dylan Mulvaney controversy. My take on this is people, if they're not boycotting. They don't want anything to do with this. They just don't want yeah. to be at the bar. Or uh, What do you think? A set, that's a massive drop in sales. What do you put that down to? Yeah, I mean, I think that when it comes to bar sales, people don't want to be caught drinking Bud Light anymore because now you're sort of like, well, you're the dope that's still buying that that item that the company hates you. Uh, Mary Catherine on her podcast, Getting Hammered, had a great sort of take about it. She said, I'm not... I'm not boycotting. I don't feel like I am sort of angrily distancing myself from the brand out of spite. She just said, you know, this is a brand that hates me. They don't want me as a customer. And I'm just listening. That's all I'm doing is listening. That is very well put. I'll ask her about that tomorrow. I never boycott anything. I think they're dumb. But I do change my consuming habits based upon an information flow. And I don't want to argue. I am so sick of politics when I'm not supposed to be doing politics. If I go on special reporter on my show, I'll talk about politics and culture and everything else. But mostly I want to focus on the NFL draft this week. And so I don't want to be drawn in to the Dylan Mulvaney conversation. And I think most of Americans are exhausted and they don't want to talk about with their children either. I mean, I, I don't want to go down and see my grandchildren this weekend and, and end up talking about Dylan Mulvaney. Yep, yep, that's exactly right. One of my favorite columns ever in the history of column writing, Jay Nordlinger, I don't know, probably 20 years ago, wrote a column, My Kingdom for a Safe Zone. And that was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And now I'm like, please, God, I would love to go anywhere or do anything without it being a value signal. And now you go to the bar and you order a beer and you have to sort of check the bona fides of your beer company to make sure that they don't hate you. You have to check your shoe company. I mean, it was Nike as well. What I found was interesting was that the Nike deal and the Bud Light deal happened simultaneously. Nike got a lot less pushed back than Bud Light. And I think it's just because people sort of associate Bud Light with not being uh, overtly political in a way that Nike has been for years. Um, but also just because they they were supposed to understand who their customers Oh, we lost Bethany there, lost her feed. She froze on us. They are supposed to understand who their customers are. They are supposed to know that. Nike is a left. There she's back. We lost you there for a second, Bethany. So you were saying Nike is known. It's from Oregon. Phil Knight just gave $400 million to Portland to rebuild their African-American neighborhoods. They are a left-wing company. Bud is Missouri. Bud is the Clydesdales. And she also attacked the fratty their vice president yes. of marketing, attacked the, the customer. I mean, it's just, yep. where do these people learn this? I mean, they learn it because they live in a bubble that is not in Missouri. I, I think that the lesson here for people in marketing, and they'll, they'll never learn it, so we'll have this conversation again in six months, is that they need to have everyone based where their customers are based. Don't hire a marketing from, firm from New York City or Los Angeles. If your customer base is from Missouri, hire someone from Missouri. And, you know, I think that conservatives want to, don't want to silo ourselves, but we need better marketing programs at the University of Iowa and hire those graduates. That's why uh, Charles Koch always um, hires from Wichita State. He just hires from Wichita oh. State and he, and he gets very competent, very successful Wichita State people who just do their jobs. Bethany, very quickly, I want to ask you about Tucker. Uh, I think he could very well be uh, Donald Trump's vice presidential selection. I don't know what happened. Nobody knows what happened. But what do you think is the reaction of the public to that? I mean, I think people were really shocked. He was probably their most popular anchor. I, I, you know, among people in the media circuit, he, he elicits very strong feelings one way or the other. Either I, it was funny. I text, I tweeted last night that I've heard so many stories of him sending out of the blue text messages and calls to people who were sort of in the lower rungs of the conservative movement. And I got a text like, look up in the, look up in the dictionary jerk this person did not say the word jerk, but, and you'll find a picture of Tucker Carlson. So there's these like very extreme 
opinions about Tucker on either side. And, and that's, I mean, that's Trump as well. So I can sort of see how he might go that route and be like, you know, this is, this is a pick that will definitely get people. Let Truman in. Let Truman in Bethany Mandel. We want to see Truman. He's just next to me. I will tweet the picture. I was like panicked the whole time that he would jump on me again. Oh, I, we love Truman. Bethany Mandel. Follow her on Twitter at Bethany Sean Dark. Her book is Stolen Youth. I'll be right back. Canada. Hugh Hewitt live from Studio Beltway. Back inside the Beltway, as is Molly Hemingway. You can follow Molly on Twitter at MZ Hemingway. Good morning, Molly. Great to be here with you. Thank you. Now, Molly, you work for Fox. I'm not going to put you in a corner and ask you to comment on what happened. Nobody really knows what happened with Tucker. I do want to know, though, if you can comment. I, I, I only know him as a green room friend. His father was instrumental in the start of my career, absolutely central to the start of my career. So I've known Tucker forever, and he's been just a nice acquaintance. And I am, I'm charmed by the number of people who are telling Tucker stories online today about how kind and generous he is. You think that's off-brand for Tucker and he resents it because he's just a very nice guy? Oh, no, you're hearing those stories because they're absolutely true. I mean, people think of him as an important figure and, and uh, spokesperson for a big part of the country, but he's also just an incredibly nice guy. And um, I know many people who have benefited from that kindness, just even like he's widely read. And so journalists who would, who would write something occasionally would get a nice comment from him. And he's really, he's actually a really good writer himself. Um, so you take time to tell people tell low-level journalists that he thought they'd done a good job with the piece. I guess it's a little different than the persona, but it's definitely real. Yeah, it is. Now, I want to talk to you about the one speculative, or that's actually two speculations I made. One, he's a Mainer. If he wanted to, he could run against Angus King, who's very popular in Maine, but he's 80 years old. And all of Nor Maine north of the Harrisica is completely red. And in Portland and south, it's deep blue until you get near the New Hampshire border. Uh, so that's speculation number one. If he wanted to, he can run for Senate. Number two, and this is from Twitter, Twitter this morning, the great mentioner's long list of possible Trump vice presidential nominees will include not only the standard, you know, Governor DeSantis and Nikki Haley and Tim Scott, but also people like Mike Pompeo, Ambassador O'Brien, Rick Grinnell, Tom Cotton, Mike Gallagher. It'll also have Tucker on there because that's the doubling down that Al Gore served for um uh, Bill Clinton. What do you think about that? That would be a very Trumpian move. Yeah, I, I hadn't really thought about it at all. I definitely talked to a lot of people who wish that he would run for office in some way. And I hadn't really even thought about the vice presidential angle. I guess it's a possibility. I, <laughs> I learned one thing in 2016, which is never to think that you know how to predict how things will go. And so uh, certainly, you know, certainly there'd be a market for it at the very least. I don't know if I don't know if he would want to do that. Now I bring it up because this morning in the Biden reannouncement video, Kamala Harris features prominently in there. That just kills all speculation she's going to be dumped. So they're stuck with her. And but she does do one thing. She can go around the country and raise money for your campaign. If you name your vice president early, you can dispatch them out. Uh, and Donald Trump broke precedent when he named his Supreme Court list early. Think he will name a vice president early if he if it helps him. You know, Richard Swiker, I've been reading the Richard Norton Smith biography of Gerald Ford, and I'd forgotten that Reagan picked Richard Swiker in 1976 as last ditch Harold May in the in the battle for delegates. What do you think about picking somebody early? Just break and you know, name your whole cabinet early, no matter who the Republican is. I love the reference to the judge list because that ended up being so important for Donald Trump's 2016 campaign. I think something like 25 percent of Republican voters said that they voted for him precisely because he had he had done this with the list of potential justices. And so that created a totally different paradigm for Republican voters where they realized they could sort of demand things of their candidates. And particularly on the cabinet level, I like the idea of coming up with a list of who you choose from so that you get the idea of what type of people you're going to have. I think Trump had tried to do a, uh, a blended cabinet where you had a lot of establishment figures more than the people that had, had brought him to power. Uh, so maybe naming whether he would do that again or whether he would have people who wanted to get more done, that would be really interesting. Uh, but I don't know how effective it is to name a VP early. I know 
again, who knows? You don't predict anything from after we lived through 2016. But it always seems kind of like a weak move to pick your VP before, um, you know, too early, almost like desperate. So I don't know. I don't know. Now, you know one thing I want to note. Mitch McConnell, though he is not Donald Trump's favorite, got Donald Trump elected by holding open the Scalia vacancy created by the uh, Supreme Court justices on timely death. And that created an issue, and Donald Trump sees the issue. If he put out a list of possible VPs, it would also help you vet, because what people didn't understand when Steve Schmidt and Nicole Wallace came up with Sarah Palin, I like uh, Governor Palin, but they didn't understand that there were downsides there. Because she was so out of left field. The only person I'd ever heard talk about her was Michael Medved. And I thought, that's just not going to happen. Alaska it doesn't. And, of course, you never know what's going on. But when it's done in secret, you open yourself up to wild swing. It's like when Stuart Stevens didn't let anyone see the draft of Mitt Romney's acceptance speech, no one was able to say to him, why don't you mention the American military in this? We're in a war. And I mean, just if you stay in a closed room, you only get the views that are in the room, Molly. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Although John McCain is kind of uh, dead in the water until he picked Sarah Palin. So I'm not sure how bad that pick was, even if, you know, uh, with Steve Schmidt, Nicole Wallace, you mentioned, ended up kind of sabotaging her from the, from yes. the inside on that. But, um, yeah, no, the more outside – and I, I actually think, you know, the 2016 campaign with Trump was chaotic. It was a mess. You had people yelling at each other, but it actually produced a really good campaign with with vibrant ideas. The 2020 campaign was more shut down. It was more orderly. Everyone kind of agreed on the campaign team, and then they would present issues to President Trump. I think that there's something to be said for having just that chaos and, and uh, yelling at each other, even in the same way that the 2016 primary, which seemed like a mess because you had all these people up on the stage, actually let people litigate issues, you know, discuss issues, think about what they wanted. Whereas, again, in 2020, there was no competition and so there was no debate over what people wanted. I like the idea of opening up the room, you know, having people just yell at each other about what they want and you, you get a better result. I, I agree. Now, Molly, the last thing that matters in America is whether or not media personalities have a favorite. I don't. I'm in Switzerland. I assume you are as well. But I, I also don't think the polls about Donald Trump being uh, un, un, unbeatable so far ahead make a bit of difference at this point. I think anyone can win this thing because, again, reviewing the 1976 race, the 1980 race, everything is open until it's closed. Do you agree with me on that? We just don't know what. I mean, what if China attacks Taiwan in the next year, which would make sense given that Joe Biden is the weak, uh, uh, feckless president that we've got and wouldn't do anything? What What do you think is the the uh, volatility index on this race? Well, it, it would. I think it might require a lot of external influence to, to change things up fundamentally, but that's totally a possibility. And, you know, people I hear, you know, obviously Donald Trump is doing extremely well in the polls. And when it comes to voting, that seems like it would help him a lot. But I hear people saying that Ron DeSantis is too far behind. He's actually doing really well as well. He's not even running for president. And he has a huge percentage of the Republican Party saying that they would like him. And you've got him as the sort of number two option for most Trump voters and vice versa. Uh, I don't know about the rest of the Like, I don't think Asa Hutchinson has like a huge shot here. But with... 60, 70, 80 percent of the Republican Party behind either Trump or DeSantis. I think that gives a good idea of the direction the party wants to go, but it's not a done deal by any stretch of the imagination. And Molly, I, I have been doing a deep dive in the New Hampshire primary uh, over the years. I mean, over 40 years. It's very hard to predict what they're going to do. Chris Sununu is a factor in this race as well. The governor of New Hampshire is a, a center right uh, Republican, not a conservative in the traditional sense. Do you think New Hampshire will play as big a role as it traditionally has? And, and it is true. No Republican has ever won the White House without winning New Hampshire first. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's an important state to win. But again, I don't know how much campaigning we're seeing there yet, so it's hard to know how it would go. And, uh, you know, this, this, these are such weird times. But there's a reason why people focus on that state. It's important. Yeah. Last question. Bud Light sales down 17%. I'm asking all my guests today, what is the takeaway you have from that number? It's remarkable to me how much this organic boycott has had an effect on Anheuser-Busch. And hopefully that does send a message to other companies about just being you know, enslaved to leftist wokeism. 
Uh, but I do think also the right needs to know how to do some more organized demands too. Yes, it's good that the sales are down in terms of accomplishing goals for the right, and it's good that they put that BP on leave. But when the left does, when the left makes demands of corporations, they get millions or even billions of dollars in sort of reparation type response. They get positions on boards. They get their own people in the company. Oh, We've seen nothing like that yet. So I think if Anheuser-Busch is serious, maybe they should start treating conservatives like they treat the left. Interesting. Hadn't thought about that. Mom. I just thought it was sort of a Chick-fil-A. You use the term organic. That's exactly what it is. When Chick-fil-A was under attack, an organic a rally around them occurred. And this was an organic, put that away. We're not getting into a political debate here when I'm drinking a beer. Molly Hemingway on Twitter, MZ Hemingway, see her on Fox, come right back.